Welcome back, viewers. I still have with me Dr. John Ofori Tinkran, the Director General of SNET. Now, we're going to talk about a little about past credit. We know that uh, there has been some agitation from organized labor concerning this issue. Um, some have expressed dissatisfaction, claiming that you know the amounts they, they, they get from their former uh, colleagues receive a lump sum. We have heard several explanations on the matter, but you know we don't seem to see the explanations very clear. So the agitations are still there. Can you please explain to us what what this whole thing about past credit is? Very well, I, I will do that. Right. But just before I do that, mm -hmm. just allow me to conclude a thought uh, before we went on the break. Okay. Um, so this is the, the one related to uh, somebody getting a 1000 in basic and then sure. the other 4000 in other forms of compensation, sure. which is not insured. Mm -hmm. with net, right? So, and the person was going home then with 600 Ghana cities, right, the, at retirement uh, because it's 60% of the basic, for example. So let's ask the question. If that person had insured everything, right? And mm -hmm. So instead of only coming to us and say it's one thousand, mm -hmm. if they had come and said my real lifestyle is six five is five thousand, what would that picture have looked like? That retirement picture would have looked like this. He would then be getting, let's say, sixty percent of the five thousand. Six five thirty. That's three thousand Ghana cities mm -hmm. a month, right? Mm -hmm. So now. The proposition will be, instead of the Wahala going in and now taking transport, going to work, blah, 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 and getting 5,000 Ghana cities, why don't you go sit at home and relax? At the end of every month, you will get 3,000 Ghana cities. Right? That's a much better proposition, right? Sure, sure. Than go home and relax, and you get 600, 600. Ghana cities. So that's why people would say they don't want to go on pension. But it's because we have a good structure within which they can fit, but they did not take advantage of that structure. So the long and short is that I think that um, employers and employees, when they're talking about compensation, they have to factor into it the implications of that compensation structure on pension. It's not only focusing on what am I getting today, but as part of that compensation structure that you are going to negotiate today, mm. spend a bit of time, spend a moment to think about its implication on pension. I think that's, that's a point I want to but carry. Be, before we come to a lump sum, um, do companies contribute regularly? They are supposed to you know, um, give you the contribution they've taken from their employees every month. Do they do that constantly? Yeah. And I know you also have some yes. uh, uh, dedicated courts that yes. you prosecute. Some of Can you yes. talk okay. a bit about it? So the, the answer is some do contribute regularly without fail. Mm -hmm. Others don't. Okay. So the law allows us, because we are here to protect the Ghanaian worker, mm -hmm. the law is generous enough to us and gives us the mandate to enforce compliance, to basically okay. go to the companies and force them to make those contributions. Okay. And if they don't pay on time, the law asks us to even add some punitive damages onto it. Mm -hmm. First of all, they, they, they are supposed to pay interest, right? And then on top of that, there are some punitive, uh, you know, interest rates for, you know, bringing it in late, right? So we have an army of compliance officers, uh, s staff, who go out there and check on these uh, companies. We do routine checks, but sometimes we also get whistle blow the whistle being blown from employees who will say, hey, this person is not paying my contributions. So they check, they check from the contributions Correct. from your system. Right. right. So, so now, now that we've, you know, if we make it available, for all contributors to be able to check on their statement. Mm -hmm. Then when something doesn't occur in a particular month and you wait for the next month and it still hasn't shown up, you can, you can reach, out, reach out to us, right? And say, hey, I'm still working. It's not that I have stopped work mm -hmm. because it could be that you've stopped work and that's why the contribution didn't come in. 
But if you are still working and it's not showing up, you let us know. We will do the work for you. We won't tell your employer who called us. Mm -hmm. Right? We it's our job. So we will go and make sure that the right thing is done. Uh, and where we engage an employer to do the right thing, and uh, we are not getting any joy, uh, meaning that the person employer is not complying and cooperating, then we go as a matter of last resort to the law courts. Uh, and the law makes it very clear that uh, to default on social security contributions as an employer is a criminal offense in you, uh, the MD, in its own personal capacity. So you, the MD, will be hauled before the courts and um, be uh, undergo a criminal trial if, that's a, if it gets to that part. But what we find out is that most of the time, once we engage, uh, you know, th th we reach a common understanding. Uh, and also when people realize that the, there's a specter of uh, criminal prosec prosecutions uh, hanging over their neck, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, they readjust uh, and, and make sure that the right thing is done. So uh, we are here to protect the Ghanaian worker. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to let the worker, we need to give them the tools to help us protect them. And that is why we've tried, we place a very high premium on transparency and making sure that the worker knows what is being done on his or her behalf by the employer. Okay. okay. So I think I've answered your question. Sure, sure. So let me go back, with your permission, let me go back to your first question, the mm -hmm. one that you asked, which is the issue on the past credit. Yes. Uh, and let me see whether I can summarize it and, and you know, make it understandable for everybody. So the we've just transitioned between an old pension law to a new pension law. The old one was called the PNDC Law 247. And the new one, which is the three-tier pension system that mm -hmm. we are running now, is Act 766, which was actually amended by another act called 83. Now, the old law, PNDC Law 247, made SNET the only provider of pensions. So the pension was SNET sure. for a long time. And with the introduction of Act 766, they said, okay, we're going to do three tiers. And the three tiers, we're going to let SNET do one part, which is the tier one. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to let private uh, players come into the pension space. And they're going to take care of what we call tier two and tier three. Tier three. So the first tier is almost sim very similar to what the old one was, the PNDC Law 247. It was also a defined benefit scheme, right, where at the beginning you know exactly what benefits you are going to get if you meet certain qualifying criteria. Okay. So the first year of Act 766 sort of mimics that of the PNDC Law 247, okay? Uh, and the uh, Tier 2 and Tier 3, right, are sort of new introductions, which are not defined benefit schemes, but they are what we call defined contribution schemes. So what is a defined contribution scheme? Unlike defined benefit, where at the beginning you know exactly what you are going to get because the benefits are defined. If mm -hmm. you meet this criteria, rain or shine, this is what you're going to get. Right? Unlike that, the defined contribution scheme says that what you are going to put in, you are only going to get that with interest. Okay? So it is what you put in, it's going to go in your name, and you are, it's going to be invested solely for you, right? When you say what is in your name, that means what it's was... Uh, yeah, what was contributed, contributed on your behalf. behalf. Okay. It's going to be invested solely for you, okay. right? And depending on how well your fund manager does, right, whatever returns he gets on it, that is what is going to be passed on to you. Okay. You see. So whether if your fund manager does really well, 
of course, it's good for you. If your fund manager doesn't do well, you know, it's not so good for you. But on the other, the first one, which is the defined benefit, whether the fund manager does well or not, you are entitled as a SNP one, right? Okay. So, so that's the tier two, and then there is a tier three. The tier two says that you, uh, it takes uh, five percent of your salary, your basic salary. And then the tier three, you can contribute an additional sixteen and a half percent, right? Tax free, and put it uh, away for you know your pension, okay? Um, you know, uh, as it's in a manner similar to the tier two. The tier two is compulsory, right? The tier two is compulsory, but the tier three is not. Okay, it's voluntary. So now let me come to the substantive thing. So. In PNDC Law 247, PNDC Law 247, when you went on pension, you had the option of taking 25% of your pension, which means your future monthly payments that are going to be paid to you until the good Lord calls you, mm -hmm. you have a, an option of taking 25% of that upfront today. So I've turned 60 today. I'm going on pension. I've applied. I can elect that for the monies that you're going to pay me in the future, pay me 25% of that upfront today in the form of a lump sum. And then I'm only going to be collecting 75% of that going forward. Right? Okay. So that is the lump sum under PNDC law 247. Right? Now, that lump sum as I said, it's just 25% of the pension. Mm -hmm. And it's calculated in a very interesting way. Interesting in the sense that the pension is calculated using only your best three years of earnings. Your best... That, that is something people don't really understand. Yes. It, it, it just takes only your best three years of earnings, averages it, and assume that over the course of your employment, you were earning that salary. So let's say I worked for 20 years. Mm -hmm. In the first 17 years, mm -hmm. I was earning, I was a junior staff. Mm -hmm. So I was earning, let's say, 1,005. Mm -hmm. Then in the last three years, I was paid, I jumped to about, um, let's say, 4,000. Thank you. So that's where the calculations will, you, you start from. Yes. So your pension will be calculated and say, okay, you work for 20 years, right? It was paid 4000 throughout. Yeah. And he said, you work for 20 years. So if you work for 20 years, let's mm -hmm. say you are entitled to, let's say, maybe 50%, uh, 50%, five zero, half a hundred mm -hmm. of your salary, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to ask, so what salary? We'll say, oh, look for the best three years. Oh, we look for the best three years. We saw what? 4,000. Is it 4,000 mm -hmm. that you said? 4,000, yes. So we we'll say, look for the best salaries three years. Oh, 4,000. Okay. 20 years, say 50%, right? Best salary, 4,000. Give me 50% of 4,000. It doesn't matter that you were doing 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. doesn't matter. So when we calculate that pension, that pension only sees your 4,000, right? It only sees that. And so if we are going to give you uh, a percentage of that upfront, that percentage that we are giving you is indexed on that 4,000, right? Because that's what is used to calculate your pension. And so that's what you can take upfront. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. However, the new scheme says that whatever you are going to get as a lump sum, mm -hmm. it's going to take all the contributions that you made and then calculate interest on those contributions, accrue them, add them together and pay it to you as a lump sum. And so that's why when you see, when you make your 5% contributions to the tier 2 and that is a defined contribution and they basically uh, accumulate that, that at the end will become what you are going to get as your lump sum. Because SNIT will not, is not paying anymore that lump sum. 
right? Because the, the law says that we should just pay the monthly pensions. And that's why they hyped off part of the contributions to the tier two provider who invested and basically gives you that lump sum at the end. So that lump sum is dependent on every single contribution that goes to them, right? You see, unlike the other one where it is only predicated on your best three years. Okay? So what 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 is happening? If um let's say from the day the law came into effect, which is uh, January 2010, you had not contributed to SNED before. You were not a SNED contributor. You joined the pension scheme. From that day forward, all your lump sum contributions, which is the tier two, that 5%, mm -hmm. goes to your tier two manager, right? And then your 11% stays with SNED, okay? And so when you go on pension, SNET will pay based on that 11 percent, your and that's monthly pensions, and then your tier two manager will pay. You will take all the accumulated five percent and give it to you as a lump sum, right? So two clear, distinct things: you go to your tier two manager for your lump sum, you come to SNET for your monthly pensions. If you started in first January 2010, right? So what happens if you started if you are SNET contributor? before 1st January 2010. You mean okay. you were part of the contribution, uh, the old law, and then all of a sudden, come January 2010, they say, now we're going to bifurcate tier two regular pensions, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were part of the old law, meaning people who were uh, retired under the old law uh, uh, up until uh, last year, mm -hmm. they, uh, they got part of the alarm sum they, they got the alarm sum paid by SNET, right? The people who retired yeah. last year. Yeah. But then, let's say that you are retiring one year after, right? So that means majority of your contributions, a lot of it stayed with SNET, right? Before the law, before 2010. So everything that ha you contributed before 2010, mm. which was in respect of what would have been paid as lump sum, stayed with SNET. Mm -hmm. And then it's only after 2010, that part of the prospective contributions went to the tier two fund manager. Right? Okay. So now, when you are going on pension, you go to the tier two fund manager to get what you've been giving them since 2010. Right? And then you come to SNET to get what you had been giving us in respect of the lump sum prior to 2010. You, you get me now? So there is some amount of money that you give to SNET prior to 2010, which was sort of synonymous to maybe the 5% that was going to your tier 2, right? Which is not going to be factored in when we are calculating your monthly pensions. Mm -hmm. So we have to refund that to you as a lump sum. And as you have explained to you, that lump sum depends on every single contribution that you made. Unlike the first one where I said it doesn't matter what it was, you went on pension in the last three years, and that's, that's what it is. So what has then happened is that the, there are some retirees who, when they retire today, and they have a colleague, let's say, who retired last year, because the... Uh, depending on the nature of their contributions. So, for example, because the one who retired last year, the, under the old law, we just look at the, the, your best three years and calculate your lump sum on the basis of that. If we come and we say that, okay, for you, because you are retiring this year on the other side of the law, mm -hmm. we're going to look at every single contribution that you made and accumulate it with interest, right? You may find out that the two numbers that you get may be different because it's calculated differently. Okay? Some may be higher than others. There are people who are, in terms of lump sum, because of their contribution profile, are better off under the old law than under the new law, and, there, and vice versa. There are people who are getting are better off under the new law than the old law because of the profile of the contributions and the nature the, the way the, the thing is calculated. 
So what then happened is that uh, I think uh, there are people, workers, who when they retire under the new law and find out that this is what they are going to get as a lump sum, which is what they got from their tier two, plus what they will get with SNET with the respect of the lump sum, which we call the past credit. It's past credit is because it's before 2010, past, and there's a credit in their name. Okay? okay. That's what they call the past credit. When you add that to the, uh, to the tier two, some find out that their number is smaller than, let's say, their colleague who retired last year completely under the old law. And so for that difference, they're saying, okay, we, they are being shortchanged, right? Okay. But the converse is also true. There are people who would who have higher. Uh, higher. Okay. It goes both ways. Now, so it is that lump sum difference that uh, uh, Labour was focused on mm. and saying that, well, the law should not make anybody worse off. And so to the extent that the reform is supposed to make people better off, then uh, people should get at least the same lump sum. Okay? And that has, you know, we deliberated on it and, uh, you know, uh, Snape's position was, look, uh, this is the law and we are here just to implement the law. Right? Uh, so they, they brought in the presidency because the, 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 there's a, a National Pensions Act. And uh, the, the, His Excellency, the President, uh, in his wisdom, decided that, you know, committee should be put together. And then to the extent that there are people whose lump sums are, you know, smaller under the new law, right, in this transition period, mm -hmm. that the government will find a way to uh, plug the hole, so to speak, or top it up. But having said that, the concept of the new law improving pensions, uh, that concept is well, was well thought out and it's actually uh, uh, well um, executed in the sense that if you look at what a pensioner will get under the new law mm -hmm. over his or her lifetime, all right, and you calculate that value and you compare it to what a pensioner was getting under the old law over the entire lifetime and you compare the value, you find out that the lifetime benefits under the new law is higher than the lifetime benefits under the old law. So the, 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 the idea or the wish to improve pensions with the reform, that has been satisfied. Okay. It is just this idiosyncratic lump sum thing within the transition period. So how many were affected? Oh, I think... Uh, See, it's, uh, let's say that every year, eh, approximately, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, we have about maybe 16,000 people going on pension. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So just keep the round numbers round. Uh, and the people that are entitled to pass credit are people who had retired from 2010 all the way back up because there are people who retired in 2011 mm -hmm. to, uh, you know and, and the law that uh, and the law also made it optional for people to opt as to which uh, pension scheme they want to be on until 2020 when everybody will have to switch but within that transition period from 2010 to 2020 there was an optionality for people to decide do I want to be on this scheme or do I want to be on this scheme so people will look at it and decide which one is better for them right and they will choose which one I want. So once you retired on Act 766 and you were contributing to SNED before 2010, you are entitled to some past credit. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we've had to do computations on past credit, we've had to uh, uh, do it for people who retired from 2010 on onwards. But on this particular issue of the uh, government topping up the lump sum mm -hmm. for 2020 retirees, I think we're going to have about close to 20,000 people that will be uh, affected. So how much, how much has been, was the top up from government? Uh, we are yet to calculate it. Yeah. So they haven't benefited from it yet? Um, the, the, the differences in the lump sum mm -hmm. 
we we haven't paid that yet. Right now, there is a committee that is working out those differences. Oh, okay. So when when do you think they will be paid? Oh, I think that uh, you know uh, basically uh, within the next uh, month or month and a half, uh, at least the calculations will be made. Uh, and then I think payment latest maybe during the first uh, quarter of the new year they will be they will be paid because right now we are almost in December right yeah, yeah almost in December now the, the we had an agreement with with labor uh, where we had a month to work out these differences okay so that month to work out the differences probably will put us maybe middle uh, close to Christmas mm -hmm. right and then. Uh, basically, then you have to uh, pay. So, probably sometime in January, right? That'll be in the first quarter of next year. Then you get paid. So that's an assurance. So you are looking at twenty thousand people. Yeah, thereabouts. I think I think that's uh, that's that's going to be the number. That's about the number of people that will probably retire. Uh, uh, so, are able to tell us the average what each is going to get? We are working on. We are we are now doing the calculation. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. But 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 it wouldn't be that much, right? Yeah, uh, okay. Because, um, like I said, there are even people whose lump sum under the new law mm -hmm. is higher than the other one. Oh, so okay. such people, they don't. There is no need for top up, right? Because they are already better off. Okay. Yeah. All right, viewers, we'll take another short break. When we come back, we are going to wrap up. This time, we are going to look at SNET investments and what the future looks like for all of us. Stay tuned. Have you thought of having access to your news at any time and anywhere? Graphic Communication is giving you the opportunity to have news not only in hard copy but also in a digital form. Yes, you can have access to news at all times and even before they reach the newsstands. Simply download the Graphic News Plus from Google Play Store on your Android and App Store on your iOS device and get your digital news from your favorite daily graphic, graphic business, the mirror, graphic showbiz, junior graphic, and graphic sports. Download your Graphic News Plus now and choose your preferred package daily, weekly, monthly, and annually and access free news on various interest areas as well. Visit us on graphic.com.gh for further information. Graphic News Plus, connecting people through news. Welcome back viewers. I'm still with Dr. John Ofori Tengran, the Director General of SNET. Um, my final wrap is about SNET investments. Doc, we know that if you don't, SNET doesn't invest well, you don't put the, uh, you know, the contribution of, uh, what do you call it, pensioners in the right investments, it, it will affect the, 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 what they get or maybe the survival of the, of the, of the, of the fund. Can you walk us through a bit of some of what you've invested in, how they are performing and all? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. Um, yes, uh, SNET, the way we are set up, uh, our scheme is uh, what we call a, a partially funded scheme. And okay. what that means is that the benefits that we pay, mm -hmm. the contributions that people make alone enough, is, is, is not enough to pay for the benefits. Okay. Uh, I, I was telling you at the beginning that people get probably more than twice, three times, four times more than uh, what they put in plus interest. Uh, I, I made that point before. Yeah. So, so we rely on investment returns to sort of plug the hole, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So any monies that we take today that we do not use to pay benefits and we do use current contributions, part of current contributions, to pay benefits. And mm -hmm. that's the way it's structured. Yeah. Any, any excess, we'll have to invest. So that's how SNED gets into the investment space. Um, the investments that we do um, are in a bunch of areas. For a fund such as ours that uh, will need liquidity uh, in you know short uh, periods of time, mm -hmm. we have to have some of our investments in uh, bonds, uh, what we call it fixed income, 
and the fixed income, we, oh, you actually have to get it with uh, a fixed income instrument is sort of like an IOU. You give somebody money and they promise to pay you back at a later date with interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want to make sure that the person is credit worthy. So we'd like to focus a lot on government bonds, okay, because the government will be there to pay. Then we have some uh, investments uh, in the stock market, in the equities market, uh, where we own shares of companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then we have some investments in um, what we call the alternative investments, which is so, we, and, and in, in when we talk about that, the thing that comes into mind for most people is real estate. So when you look around and you ask people what are SNET investments, I think a lot of people will point to real estate because mm -hmm. we own commercial buildings and sometimes we do uh, some of these uh, residential buildings that you know people um, um, you know purchase and stay in so so that's how we are we end up in the investment space I would say that in general uh, you know like every investment portfolio there are good ones that do well and there are ones that don't do so well mm -hmm. and ours is no exception uh, I'll say that in, for example, in uh, in 2017, uh, when the stock market um, was very buoyant, mm -hmm. and I think it got buoyant because there was a lot of monies that were moved uh, uh, into the various pension schemes. The government came and funded all these, uh, um, uh, paid all these arrears to the tier private pension, pension funds, the tier yeah. two funds. Um, and so I think a lot of money went into the stock market and, and, and made it very buoyant. And, and so we did fairly well in, 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 in the equities market. But then, you know, come 2018, with the recapitalization of banks, mm -hmm. uh, clean up in the financial sector, uh, a lot of banks, um, instead of paying dividends, they had to plow back those dividends to meet their minimum capital the requirement. Yeah. And, and, and you know, for a fund like us, because we are so big, it's very difficult for us to go and sell stocks in the stock market because mm -hmm. you are the market. Who do you sell to? You know, once you start selling, everything comes down. The price moves against you. So we call it that. We don't have that much liquidity. So we rely on a lot of dividends. That's mm -hmm. how we, we get returns on our, on our investments when they pay us dividends, right? Uh -huh. So a lot of banks uh, in 2018 uh, did not pay dividends, right? Uh, because the mar their monies were plowed back into their businesses. Um, so, so uh, 2018, our equity investments, you know, have not done, you know, that well. But I suspect the market in general has been is, is yeah. been down. Yeah. Um, now, the, the real estate sector is where we have quite a few challenges. Mm. Uh, we have uh, a lot of work in progress, as we call it. Uh, we inherited a lot of uh, real estate projects that were uh, at various stages of completion. Mm. Um, and we have some high-end real estate, and then we have some uh, real estate that is also high-end. That's what we call the affordable housing. Um, you know, the market in real estate has generally been soft in the past, you know, few years, mm -hmm. um, and um, and it kept kept asset prices a little bit depressed. So the ones that we've completed, which was the Bortiman affordable housing, and then the one we just renovated, uh, uh, inaugurated in Kumasi, which is the Asokori Mampong, which was named after her. Is Royal Majesty or say to two. Mm. Uh, those have been completed and we are selling those. Um, the, the pricing of those is such that um, in, we are not really making that much of a, a profit on that. Uh, but we need to let those go so that we can get liquidity and, and redeploy. The others, which are the high end stuff, um, you know, there's one across from 37 mm -hmm. uh, military hospital, and then there we have one in. Donkuna, and then we have some uh, um, in Sakumono, and so on and so forth. Those are now uh, being completed, 
Um, and so um, we haven't gotten to the point where we will be selling them yet. Now, having said that, you see, because the market uh, is a bit depressed, mm. one of the things you always have to make sure is that you are getting value for money. Okay. And so when you get into these projects and you look at your prospects for sales and they, not, they don't look that good, then you have to look at how you cut costs to be able to reduce your cost so that maybe your profit margin is maintained or maybe increased. So uh, since we, I came into office, we've had to do a lot of audit on a lot of these ongoing projects and negotiate uh, with contractors uh, to basically modify the execution plan so that we can save on some cost uh, to make the, prof uh, the project a, a little bit more profitable. Mm. And, and, and I can say that since we started that exercise over the three and a half years, uh, we've saved well in excess of about 200 million Ghana cities uh, in, in, in renegotiation and readjusting and reducing the, our cost base for both uh, investment costs and even some of our service providers. So, so that's for the housing sector? For the housing sector. Uh, and, and, um, and some other, you know, areas uh, related to, um, you know, our costs for running SNET, even, even in the ICT sector. Uh, we've had to renegotiate certain contracts uh, to make it a little bit more sustainable for us. Mm -hmm. So in general, uh, I think the short answer to your question is that, um, yes, we are in the investment space. Like every portfolio, some are doing well, some are not. The areas where we have challenges, such as the real estate sector, we've tried to do something about it by basically re trying to reduce our investment costs going in. Uh, the ones that have to do with just the market, uh, the ups and downs of the market, hmm. we are a buy and hold uh, investor. So we, we, we will stay still active in the we we'll stay in the stock market, and hopefully look for a, a turnaround. Um, and with the uh, fixed income sector, uh, whenever we get a chance to uh, buy more government bonds, we like to do that. Uh, because they've been, that sector has always been a reliable, um, you know, sector for us to be in. And for a pension fund such as us, uh, we can actually use a lot more fixed income. So before I go to my final question, um, can you tell us from what you've, you've, you've told me right now, can you say that SNIT still has a future? The, 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 the pension scheme still has a future, tier one? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think I'll be remiss if I say that it doesn't have a future. It, of course it does. Mm. Uh, it, it serves a very important purpose, right? And that one is no doubt. Like I said, over 220,000 people and their families mm -hmm. uh, rely on us every month. So, so we need to make it have a future. It does have a future, but we need to make it have even a brighter future, right? So, so, so for me, uh, Giving where we are and, uh, you know, and the purpose that we serve, I think with the proper management, the prudent management of the scheme. And it's not only, when I say management, I'm not talking only investment, but I'm talking about even operations, how we streamline our operations to make sure that we do more with less. Okay. Right? With all of that and retooling and refocusing of our strategies to uh, serve our you know, members and clients, mm -hmm. give them value so that other people can be attracted to come and join us, that they will find the scheme attractive enough to join. I think there is a lot more that we can do going forward uh, because, like, right now, we have only about 1.6 million people active in our, on our scheme. Mm. But as out of a total workforce of about maybe 15 or 16 million, so we're talking only about 10% of the eligible people who can get on the scheme who are on the scheme, right? So, so we've got a lot to do to grow the fund, to grow the scheme. And so it's not like other countries where, you know, they've, they've hit the brick wall. 
because the population is not young, the working population is decri declining, and so on and so forth. Ours is sort of the reverse. So, so the future is bright, but it, it's going to take a, quite a bit of hard work and ingenuity mm. and um, you know, uh, integrity in managing the scheme you know, and some professionalism to make sure that we can deliver and provide social security for every working Ghanaian. Look, before I go to what advice you have for both employees and em employers mm -hmm. as far as their contribution towards the sustainability of this fund is concerned, let me ask this. Um, we've heard that government is not, you know, um, is indebted to is indebted to you for many years. Yeah. How 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 is it managing it now? Because we know if if those monies don't come consistently, it will affect the size of your investment. Yes. Okay. So the, 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 our scheme is such that right now I think we have a lot more private sector people contributing okay. to the scheme than public sector. Public it, sector. In the past, it used to be the reverse. The reverse. But mm -hmm. now I think we are about fifty one, forty nine, or fifty one, fifty two, forty eight in favor of private sector that okay. about so um, and yes if uh, a, a contributor an employer mm. if an employer does not remit the contributions to the scheme mm -hmm. uh, it is detrimental to the scheme because you need to get the money on time and use it to generate the returns that you will need to be able to meet your future obligations sure. it's very simple now, I mean, governments in the past, uh, maybe when there is a little bit of uh, tightness in the fiscal space, mm -hmm. uh, having been regular in, in making the requisite uh, remittances. Um, and so there has been, you know, debts that have piled up, you know, from before, way before even this government. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so... The, uh, we've engaged government and uh, His Excellency the President through the Minister for Finance uh, you know have been I think quite good uh, where last year when they were engaged uh, the Minister of Finance uh, said that they will start retiring all these areas including the ones uh, you know that is inherited, inherited. Mm -hmm. and by issuing us uh, half a billion uh, Ghana cities in, in bonds, which are the fixed income instruments that we need. We mm -hmm. need them anyway. Mm -hmm. We need, uh, you know, even if we got cash, we would have to use it to buy uh, some Those of bonds. these instruments. So okay, we might yeah. as well get them. So we've been receiving half a billion Ghana cities uh, uh, every quarter uh, to since? Since, since this year. So okay. in, in, in the first quarter, we got our first half a billion. Uh, and then uh, in the second quarter, we've got the half a billion. Uh, somewhere in between first quarter and second quarter, in the middle of COVID, uh, we needed some money. In there, they gave us cash. Uh, we got about 700 million Ghana cities in cash. Uh, we are yet uh, about to receive the, working on the third Fourth quarter. Third quarter. Uh, okay. yeah, third, because third quarter has ended. Sure. So uh, hopefully soon we're going to get the other uh, half a billion. And then end the fourth quarter with half a billion. I think that if they follow through with this program, I think uh, by maybe sometime next year, middle of next year, we would have made a significant uh, dent into the areas, including those that was inherited. So I, I, I would think I will give the Minister for Finance, uh, you know, some some kudos here for actually focusing and realizing that it's very important that we get these areas settled. That's a bold step. Yes. Yeah. So finally, what would you want to tell contributors, sorry, the employees and then employers? Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for them? Let me talk about the employers first. Mm -hmm. I think I like employers to know that it makes good business sense to pay Social Security on behalf of your employees. Why do I say that? I say that because uh, times are changing, and is you know people are when people look at places where they want to work, uh, issues as to how is my post work life going to look like 
are becoming, you know, uh, uh, of uh, significance in the sense that look at, l l l let me get down to a construct that I think people maybe will bring it home. When, when you hire somebody, let's say you get a young person to come and live with you in your house to take care, to help manage the home, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in our traditional construct, you take the person, the person is working for you, you pay the person, but you know that when the person is about to leave and maybe go and get married or whatever, uh, you have to see the person off, right? Yeah. And you want to make sure that you see them off properly. So that when they go, they'll go and say, oh, I used to work for Mr. X and Mr. Y, and they did so much for me, and this is, that's how I ended up here, right? Uh, if you don't do that, and let's say that you don't really take care of this person, and when they leave, and their life is, becomes a bit, uh, uh, um, you know, wretched, they'll point back to you and say, oh, I went and lived with him, and this is all that they could do for me, right? So when, in the same way, and, and, and because of that, what you do is you put certain things aside. When you are paying them, you actually put some money aside and you say, oh, okay, when the person is about to leave, then I'm going to use it to either get them to get a trade or something, uh, buy a sewing machine or that. You know, you put some of their income aside, okay? In the same way, it is in that same spirit that employers are asked to match the funds of employees. Because when those employees retire and their lives are in the become they don't become destitute or you know, they, they live a fairly decent life. When they are talking to their young people, they will say, Oh, I used to work for ABC company and there I got a good retirement. Mm -hmm. It makes good business sense. They you get good PR uh, and um, people would want to come and work with your institution. Okay. So that's so 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 there is something in it for the employer. It's not just, you know, I'm just paying all this away and it's adding to my cost. Uh, and, and they are lucky that they have an institution set up by statute with the full backing of the government to take that obligation away from them. All they have to do is just to do the remittance and forget about it. Mm. And then we take care of the rest. Mm. Now, so the employee uh, you are never, you have to re realize that you're never going to remain young as you are. And every day that goes by that you get up and go to work, it's one less day that you're going to have to work. Because at one, one day, all that is going to stop. And when that stops, you need income to continue to live. Right? And it is important then that you put some of this money aside for that purpose, solely for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Not something that you are going to be coming to be drawing on whilst you are working because you had some hardship, so I want to uh, use it now and, 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 and spend it. Remember, that future retirement is going to come. It is as certain as the sun will rise tomorrow. That day of retirement is going to come. So you need to make sure that you are actually ensuring the lifestyle that you want to have, the lifestyle that you are having now, that you are living on. You have to ensure that lifestyle. How do you ensure that lifestyle? It is the lifestyle that has to deal with the occupation that you are in, your occupational income. That SNIT is there to ensure for you. Sure. So what that means is that make sure have a conversation with your employer that whatever work-related income that you are getting, not only from the one that uh, is employing you formally, mm -hmm. but maybe if you even have another business in one capacity you are self-employed and you are deriving income from there mm -hmm. as part of your total emolument, please declare all of that to SNET. So with the one where you are self-employed, and then up that one, you have control. So you can come and declare it to SNET, and you can ensure those salaries. The ones that you have with your employer, sit down with your employer, have a conversation about retirement, right? 
and as I said, in this one we are it's all we are lucky because the roadmap is there. You know exactly what you're going to get at the end. Mm -hmm. So have a conversation with your employer and say, okay, all these monies that you are paying me outside basic, mm -hmm. is there a way we can bring it in into the basic? They'll ask you why. It is because, because that is what is going to determine what I get when I go on retirement. Have that conversation. And I think that once labor and uh, employers start having that conversation, the, uh, the, the, the retirement benefits payable to, employers, uh, to employees mm. will improve. And I think uh, people will actually look forward in this country. That day will come where they will look forward to going on retirement than trying to uh, want to stay at work for so long, even when they are past the age of 60. So that's in, in, in total, the SNIT scheme is there to serve this purpose, to provide this vehicle for both employees and employers to ensure the future our, uh, income of uh, employees. There is something in it for employers because uh, it is good, it makes good business sense, it's good PR for your company. All right, and there's something in it for your employee because for the employees, if you focus on ensuring your total occupational income, including the self-employed, mm -hmm. your retirement will be a lot more smoother and a lot more enjoyable than if you hide all the other sources of income that you have today and only declare your basic to, uh, to SNET. Thank you once again. I think we've been educated very much on our roles as, uh, as employees and employers. My guest has been Dr. John Ofori Tinkran, the Director General of SNIT, and my name as the host is Charles Benoni Okain. I am the Deputy Editor of Graphic Business. Until we see you again, stay blessed.